principal line being part of speech tagging because there are no big part of speech taggers trained on punctuated tokens. So I have to accommodate some of these other engines that I use by turning the string into something more like what other people expect for a while and then putting it back again. And that potentially is a little bit lossy, but not terrible. Um, what I think this does allow me to do is capture some nice generalizations about, for example, paired commas um, in uh, some of positive constructions. My brother, comma, um, the guy who really should have been a, a, an architect, comma, uh, and then the rest of the sentence. I, that, those commas are both there. If I put one in or leave one out, it's a weird sentence. My brother, the architect, uh, who's my brother, the guy who should have been an architect, no commas, and then a comma at the end, that's strange punctuation. Native speakers of the language or native writers of the language will complain of that, and the parser will have trouble with that. So the licensing of paired uh, uh, punctuation, double quotes at the beginning of an end of a phrase, uh, uh, the fact that you don't put a comma at the end of I admire my brother, the guy who should have been an architect, period. That's perfectly fine. That period satisfies the paired requirement for the first comma. I don't write architect, comma, period. That would just be done. That's the point of much of the work that, that Jeff Nunberg is in this punctuation. So you, you uh, touched on a sensitive point here. I care a lot about punctuation. Um, I have spent a lot of time in the grammar trying to build that in and exploring its interaction with syntax and morphology and semantics. And, find that an interesting hub. We got kicked out of yeah, the again. It's fine. I think he's trying to solve the 40 minutes. <laughs> okay. Um, on some other yeah, virtual. Just a question because uh, uh, with reversibility, so you want to parse things mm -hmm. and you want to generate. Yeah. And you want to probably generate according to the Chicago Manual of Style. And ah, so at least what? I want to be able to. And, uh, and on the other hand, basically, you just uh, you mentioned a few minutes back that that some people don't put their commas in if yeah. uh, they say he is drunk, right? Yeah. Uh, how do you yeah. so resolve the, that, that tension? There, there are there are there are more features in the world than the ones you've seen on the screen so far, either in Emily's slides or mine. As she said, those feature structures are rather big. I have added attributes to every expression that uh, uh, distinguish uh, formality. That is the style. So you can, you can go, you can set the grammar to say, I only want to deal with analyses that have a, are compatible with a formal style. Then the word ain't is not going to be given an analysis because ain't is marked in the grammar as an informal term. Um, so when I'm generating, I won't say, my brother ain't an architect, uh, if I'm generating f uh, with, with Chicago formal style. But I also want to be able to do gradations of informality. So there's informal with respect to punctuation, and there's informal with respect to things like uh, these contracted forms, like ain't. Um, and then there's another attribute that is, uh, in, in, uh, interacts with style, but is distinct, and that's for dialect. So I need to be able to parse British text if I'm looking at the BNC, the British National Corpus, um, or the native Harry Potter text, which of course I'm fascinated by. Um, but uh, I also want to be able to distinguish that and not accidentally generate British English if I think I'm doing uh, dealing with an English audience, American English audience. Yeah, with a real English audience, I just about said. So the, the, uh, the, that notion of having individual lexical items and constructions um, that are only there. Um, so um, uh, has he a book? Um, is a strange thing for an American to say, and apparently not a strange thing for some British people to say, that inversion of the possessive have isn't a part of my dialect, but is something I can kind of make sense of. So one can add vocabulary and even construction types that are marked by dialect. And then I can constrain what I want to generate, but still allow the parser to say, uh, I can take any and all comers, and I will tell you what I know about that sentence by virtue of which lexical entries or constructions you employ to get there. So if you use the word ain't, this whole sentence is marked as informal style. If you used the, the inverted have, possessive have, you're, you're in British land, in British style like that. And I can record that. I don't refuse to parse it. I can still assign it an interpretation, but it's got a mark on it, some kind, in, in one of those features. Other questions? Is it six? No, no it's five Sorry, three. Joe. I never finished that early. How great is that? Um, okay, let me then show you a couple of other examples. So um, over in this universe, because I'd like to encourage you to see whether you can type some things in. Um, if I take, uh, let's try that example that Emily uh, had in her talk. Who can remember that out of the top of their head with the cookies? 
Emily eats cookies. <laughs> <laughs> no, Emily can. What about the rest of you? Yeah, cookies. Yeah, was it not those cookies? Uh, it was these, but that doesn't matter. It was these cookies, I think. Let's go with these. Yeah. Cookies. Nice. Tama, Kim, New, Sandy, oh. Baked. No. No, no, no we're baked by Sandy. New, right. we're baked by Sandy. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, all right, so before I hit parse on that, how many analyses do you reckon we're going to see? Uh, well, only five because you've got it limited to five. <laughs> <laughs> that, that would be cheating. Do you have a question do, though here? <laughs> okay, yeah, before I parse that, yeah. Uh -huh. uh, how do you train the lexical categories? Did you define them all, or is there some kind of statistical learner? No, the, the definitions of the categories, it's all manual. Everything that is, uh, is supposed to be true, unequivocally true about the grammar, has to be done manually. Um, but then the, the choice about which of many possible categories, like that adjective derivative versus the noun derivative, that decision is going to be based on these annotations of lots and lots of sentences I've done. So I keep looking at you and I should be yeah. looking at the person that I can't see. Um, the, you're, you're the channel. You can look right back at them and <laughs> my, my, my stern look. Um, that, that choice about uh, selection is done by the statistical model. But um, all of the construction, and that's why, it's, I mean, that's not why. One of the things that contributed to 23 years of, of uh, entertainment was in building rather a lot of linguistic objects. Lots of expressions got built. Yeah. Uh, okay, that gave some of you time to do your counting. Um, how many? Give me a, an order of magnitude uh, between 10 and 100, 100 and 1,000, 1,000 and a million. How many? Think like a machine. Hmm? It must be less than 500 according to the statistics you gave earlier. Less than 500. Why is that? Well, because it, uh, from the length of the sentence, you're not in the bracket where you yeah. typically hit the 500. Uh, <laughs> no, but I only kept it at 500. I didn't tell you how many there actually but were. This, but you, the, in the bracket where you got like to 496. Yeah, have you ever learned the word average? <laughs> can be outliers. There's, there's only one preposition here. I'm going to say under 100. All right, all right. So Emily would be among the more informed people to make a guess. Let's see how you did. Uh, most of that was lag time, I want to point out. Um, only six. Mm -hmm. not as, not as, you were correct, but a little <laughs> cautious, a little yeah. skeptical about that. Um, if we scroll down, uh, you could either try to just look at the, at the structures. I think you might be able to guess that there's going to be at least this one difference in these two that I can point to, which is that that by phrase can either be the locative by, where it actually is contentful and says, where did it happen? It happened right next to Sandy. So there was some baking that happened. Sandy was standing there waiting for the battery of the oven like she always does. And uh, she had nothing to do with the actual construction of those cookies. She was ready to consume them, she or he. Uh, so that's differentiated by uh, that note there where I said, did I combine baked the lexical entry itself with a PP? That is, you won't see it in there, but I know because of the way I have annotated these note labels that building a verb phrase out of a verb plus a preposition phrase, that's done with a head complement rule. Building a VP out of a VP plus a PP, that means I used a modifier rule. I had modifier rule. If you so, hover on that, don't you get the verb, the rule identifier? How's that? Do you get the rule identifier if you hover on the tree? Uh, there's a good question. I don't spend a lot of time yes. hovering in these ugly trees. I yes, you do. Yeah. I, I do. Okay. So here is the uh, adjunct, the, no, the head complement rule. That's not yeah, one I want. I want more. one down. This guy is the head adjunct intersective unslashed rule. Gives you a little hint about how many head adjunct rules I have, a few of them. Um, and in contrast, this node uh, at the corresponding spot is the head complement pool. And it's a complement U for the usual one, because as I said, I'm also using a variant of the head complement rule for reordering of multiple complements, like given to Kim by Sandy and given by Kim Candy to Sandy. Uh, to, to Kim, yeah. Um, uh, all right, and the other analyses, uh, can we guess what they were? Sandy, can I see what that difference is? Mm, not immediately. Uh, and this one, also not immediately. Uh, is it the issue of Sandy the noun? No. Is the compare to maybe that's an easier? Uh, yeah, the one above the by Sandy is modifying new, the new VP. Oh, okay. So she did the knowing while but she was standing right next to this. Yeah, she was 
She was watching the knowing happen. Pragmatically, entirely unlikely, but still possible. Uh, High attachment is cool. Yeah. Okay. So there, there's, there are, um, uh, there's a range of analyses. The grammar shows you exactly what they were. The semantic representation should correspond, so that by phrase should take as the thing that it's modifying the E3, which is in this case the knowing over there. So if you would get used to chasing these variables around, uh, there are tools that help us do that a little more efficiently, even as uh, grammar developers. Um, you can see that that syntactic structure corresponds to what I expect the semantics should be, that the biphrase is indeed in its semantics, taking as its argument the, the knowing, not the baking. So, yeah. Brett Hubble's pointing out, I think it might be useful to show people that through this web demo, we can also get to discriminants. It's a slightly different view from the ones that Woodley gives you, but mm -hmm. up at the top, um, you can say compare, and instead of doing selection, do compare all. Compare. So. In that next menu, just the right. Three call here. Yeah, all all analyses. Analyses. And compare. Yeah. Um, and this is giving us the semantic discriminants. Yeah, it's another another way of carving up that forest of six um, analyses, but now saying yeah. how are the semantic representations of each of those six distinct? So some of them have a make causing predication. Uh, there's the there's this lock and by phrase. It's a little bit redundant in this automatically generated structure. And can I pick those? You can. Let's try saying, I don't want that by phrase, minus, I don't want the locative by. Uh, what did that do for me? It knocked out two. Of okay, the took four. out two of the four. That's a good step forward. Uh, and then I choose what? What else have I got to work with? Uh, well, you don't want the no to be the R1 by. <laughs> That's the weird high. No, you might want the by to be right? Maybe. Somehow not, but there still. Okay, I didn't say minus on the right one. All right, so now I'm down to two analyses, and how are these distinct? <laughs> Someone named Cookie. Yeah. <laughs> oh, Cookie, yeah. So it's not always the case that people will be cooperative and use a capital letter when they do want to use a name. And here I have a radically, extremely inconsistent uh, set of entries in the lexicon. If I was looking at data, where mostly informal, mostly on the web, mostly from, I don't know, user net websites, which are annoyingly inconsistent about punctuation, and I really wanted to look at that analysis with everything else held even, then I put in lexical entries for these proper names that they used, and cookie is popular out there on the web, apparently. <laughs> um, so I put in that entry and said, okay, even if I don't see a capital letter, that's a proper name, just fine. But then, of course, that's massively annoying when I'm doing it all the rest of the time. The parse selection model is pretty good at this. It does know lowercase proper name is pretty unusual. So it doesn't much get in my way when I'm trying to use this in parsing for applications, but it's really annoying as a linguist, as you saw, because I just didn't pay attention to it. Um, and where is that, that name cookie? Yeah, go away cookie. Be gone. Um, do I have to do it? Oh, no, it does it. So then it snaps me to the only analysis that's left. So, so you can, yeah, you can if you're willing to navigate those semantic distinctions, think about them a little bit. You can also find your way without learning how, to, how, how my syntactic rules are named. You can still find your way down to particular analysis. And if you switch the mode from modern to classic on this one, it gives you the syntactic discriminants um, up at the top. Um, the mod up here? Yeah, well, yeah, modern, that's Stefan, the designer of this web interface. He doesn't like my syntactic instructions. So then you see ones that are more like the ones that I was choosing about. Slightly different one, but still gives you that same ability. You can make the choice of baked by Sandy as a head complement rule uh, or as a head adjunct intersective unslashed rule. Yeah, good. So that's there. And then can I generate? Do you know? You have to remember the number of the tree that came out last. Uh, and then you have to select it and then press generate. So it, in this case, it doesn't matter because it was, was the zero. It was the zero one? Right. Let's try so that. Which means mm -hmm. that pass election model did its job. <laughs> yeah. Uh, and how do I get back? Uh, close or just close the window, I think, that you've got. This was open a separate window. Oh, that was nice of him. Because it's classic, so he wants to keep his hands off of it, I see. Uh, and so if I then say, where's generate? Here. So you have to select number zero with the little box under the number zero. Under yeah. the number zero, this guy. Yeah. yeah. That guy. He's the analysis I want. I love it. I want to see what else the grammar can say has that same semantic representation. I mean, yeah, that same meaning. Uh, and it gives me just exactly one. Oh yeah, because in this online demo, we still have that stupid uh, grumble grumble. Um, 
there was a while when, in a fit of madness, I put um, uh, information structure constraints like uh, passivization and the focus movement as predications, um, which means then it wasn't possible to underspecify the active passive, in spite of what Emily was saying, that they really have the same meaning, the same logical content is there. I have repented of that sin, and in more, a more recent version of the grammar, <laughs> these now both generate and go both directions, but uh, not in the demo, because it's always just about 10 minutes behind me and hasn't quite caught up yet. Okay, so you get back exactly what you got there. This is essentially an over-constrained semantic representation that dictated exactly what was going to come out. I would encourage you, if you're at all interested in this grammar, to go play around there. You can type in longer sentences. You can type in weird ones. You don't have to just type sentences. You can do fragments. Um, you can experiment a little. Um, you don't, I think, get to look at the feature structures themselves, but that might be a blessing. <laughs> you might be content with that. If you do want to look at the feature structures, you can always go download the grammar. There is an instruction about how to do that somewhere on the web pages to get a copy of it yourself, and then you can look at everything. You're welcome to. Okay, I think we should call this the end of a tutorial. Thank you for your time. <laughs> <laughs>